I'm joined today by field ecologist Helen Crisp. Helen is based at Yukamara Sanctuary in the Murraylands district of South Australia, about 100 kilometres northeast of Adelaide. Helen has a huge amount of experience working in fenced reserves across Australia and is now responsible for the science program within Yukamara's 1,100 hectare feral predator free area. But her role is unique because as well as spending a lot of her time in the field working with wildlife, Helen also leads AWC's only dedicated education program for students. Uh, and over the course of the year, in a normal year, that program hosts up to 200 students at Yukamara. So it's inspiring the next generation of conservationists. Thank you so much for joining us, Helen. No worries. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Joey. Um, it's really great to be here today and to um, share with all of you um, what we do out here at Yukamara because we are one of the smaller sanctuaries um, within AWC's amazing portfolio, I guess. So it's um, great to get a bit of air time and, and share with you our little Mally magic that we've got out here. Thanks so much for, for giving us the time. So you've been at Yukamara now in this capacity for five years, but your connection goes way back a lot further than that. Can you tell us about yeah, sure. your, your family holiday 20 years ago? Oh, look, um, my mum and dad and I, we took a trip um, into South Australia. So I'm originally from the beautiful East Gippsland area of Victoria. Um, uh, one of the parts of Australia that was severely affected by bushfires earlier in the year. So yeah, about 20 years ago, we made our um, adventure into South Australia and one of the destinations was actually Yukamara Sanctuary. Um, so this would have been pre-AWC days, it would have been during Earth Sanctuary Limited uh, management time. But one of the things, my mum loves a good souvenir t-shirt and all these years later I've got it. Here it is. And I just think it's amazing that, you know, 20 years later I'm here um, working, living the dream at Yukamara. That's pretty cool. I think we might have to do a reissue of those Yukamara t-shirts. It's obviously a, a visit that stuck with you. Um, and you've had quite a long career working in fenced area reserves in particular. Um, and we know that these fenced havens are really important for species which are intolerant of feral predators like cats and foxes. Um, do you want to talk about that progression? So where, where was the first kind of fenced reserve that you worked at? Yeah, so again, um, oh, a year after I graduated from university, um, my first real job was at Arid Recovery, which is uh, in remote uh, arid zone of South Australia near Roxby Downs. And it was my dream job. You know, I got to work with threatened species. I got to engage with people and, and tell them what we were doing and why we had built a fence and, and reintroduced these locally extinct animals. Um, got to work in remote parts of Australia. It was, yeah, brilliant. So that was my first gig out of university. Um, but I have to say I got there through volunteering. Volunteering was a, a big player in that. Um, it was a really great chance for me to work, work out if I could actually live in the arid zone um, and work in a remote area. And I loved it. Um, so I was up there for about six years. And then an opportunity arose um, actually in ACT with the ANU. And um, yeah, I went over to um, Mulligan's Flat Sanctuary and worked out there for four years. And then I came here to Yukamara nearly five years ago. Right, so from uh, you know, the real arid zone in northern South Australia, that's, that's kind of desert country where arid recovery is. Yep. Uh, and then I guess Mulligan's Flat, it's more woodland, so eucalypt forest and, and grassland. Um, and I guess, what about Yukamara? I mean, the habitat there must be kind of halfway between those two, is that right? Yeah, it is. So Roxby Downs is, is the arid, or arid recovery is arid. Um, and then you've sort of got the east coast climate. Whereas here, we're in the semi-arid zone. Our long-term average rainfall here is around 270 mil each year. Um, we've already exceeded our rainfall this year that we had last year. Um, so we're already up to 125 mil this year. Last year, we only had 123 mil. And the Mallee is 
as I mentioned, you know, I've traveled to the Mallee as a, as a visitor, um, but I've never worked in it. So it was really exciting to, I guess, work in a new ecosystem. A lot of the species we have here, I've, I've worked with before. Um, but I think the key thing about Yukamara is that it's protecting really old growth Mallee. So really hollow rich trees, which are really rare um, in this day and age. Um, so to be able to be part of that new ecosystem is um, fantastic and to learn more about it. So here, Joey's got some photos here of Yukamara. Um, these are the Mallee trees. And you can almost see in the bottom left hand corner, there's some lovely hollows there. And I guess, um, you know, when you really stop and think, <clears throat> excuse me, um, the last time you saw a hollow tree, it, it's quite rare. So we get to see them here every day and we get to see um, species utilising them, um, which, which are quite rare as well. So. And it, it takes a long time for that sort of habitat to form, like hollows, it, you know, it's decades is to form. Um, so it's a, a yeah. really important patch of habitat. Um, as we mentioned, this is one of our sanctuaries which has a feral predator free fenced area. And it's been, it, it's now home to a number of reintroduced mammal populations. What are the species that we've got there at Yukamara? Yeah, so we've got bilbies here, we've got burrowing betongs, brush tail betongs, and also numbats. And um, yeah, it's, there's a whole suite of other species though that are just protected here um, because of Yukamara's presence. So things like the rare carpet python, the rare Eastern bandy bandy, which are both species of snakes. Um, we've got several species of, of rare birds that are either um, state listed as rare or endangered or in decline because they're reliant on hollow rich trees, which there just isn't anymore. So yeah, with Yukamara is a really great patch um, that is protecting a lot of species. Mm. It's, uh, it's also one of the longest established feral predator exclusion projects in the country. Um, and I think you mentioned that it was previously established by John Walmsley's project, Earth Sanctuaries. Um, do you want to just step us through that history of, of the project at Yukamara? Yeah, it's really interesting. So Yukamara was established after the success of Warawong Sanctuary, which is based in the Adelaide Hills. And it was um, managed by Earth Sanctuaries Limited, which was headed up by Dr. John Wamsley, who uh, many of you may have um, met, heard about, um, we were really fortunate to actually meet John and his family last year. They came out to one of our open days and it had been 30 years since Yukamara had established last year. So he came out and it was, um, yeah, it was really great to meet him and hear about particularly the feral animal eradication that went on. Um, particularly rabbits, getting rid of rabbits in a Mallee setting is very challenging because you don't have you know, lovely sand that you can track animals on. It's, it, it's really challenging. So to hear that process was really cool. Um, and so, yeah, so Yukamara Limited uh, began in 1989, so 30 years, 31 years ago. And then the fence was built in 1990. So that is one of the longest running um, fenced reserves for the purpose of wildlife reintroductions in Australia. Yeah, yeah, and, uh, you know, John Walmsley, who you've mentioned, he was a bit of a trailblazer. We, we often talk of, about his work as part of Earth Sanctuaries. Uh, he actually passed over a, a series of sanctuaries to AWC management. So there were um, four sanctuaries which we acquired from Earth Sanctuaries. Um, so Scotia, Dakalanta, Vakaringa and Yukamara. Um, and that was at a really important point in AWC's history when we were expanding into a national organisation. So there was a, a fence at Yukamara, but um, it's had to be upgraded over the years. Um, and I know people are probably familiar with these now, but do you want to just talk through how that fence works? Yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> so here, here I am talking about the fence to a group of very engaged people, I'm sure. Um, so I guess the fence has, fence has a number of features. So uh, the first one is the floppy top. Um, which really is, is key to keeping feral cats and foxes out. Um, along the bottom, you can see the smaller sort of mesh, so that's rabbit-proof netting. Down the bottom, you can see what we call the apron or the skirting. Um, that prevents anything digging 
uh, either from inside the fence or outside the fence from, from getting in. And then we've also got electric hot wires on the outside, again, to, to prevent animals from climbing up. So this fence design that you see here is what AWC upgraded back in 2006. Prior to that, so when um, AWC first took on the ownership and management of Yukamara Sanctuary, the fence was quite different. So the bottom half looked the same, um, but instead of the floppy top, there was a series of electric wires. And the idea of that was so that kangaroos and emus could have a bit more fluid movement through the system. Um, but unfortunately, that pr proved it was a little bit leaky for feral cats and foxes. So, yeah, so back in 2006, it was upgraded. Right. That's, um, that's really cool. And the populations that we protect there, you mentioned numbats, uh, two species of betongs, um, they are actually become an important source for reintroductions at other projects. Um, and that's, it, even over the last few years, there's been a number of uh, translocations from Yukamara. Do you want to talk about some of those? Yeah, that's right. So I guess historically, the populations that we had here were um, used as a source site for Scotia Sanctuary. So Scotia Wildlife Sanctuary was established soon after Yukamara. Um, but more recently, in 2017, um, Bilbies and Numbats uh, went from Yukamara over to Mount Gibson and helped with that reintroduction program there. Um, there's been a lot of um, work recently in the genetics of not only AWC's populations, but populations Australia-wide. And a lot of these results are, are looking at um, how Yukamara's populations compare to other populations. And ours are quite genetically distinct and quite diverse, so it makes it a really important source population, even though it is a, one of the smaller fenced areas within AWC. Yeah, now, like everyone, I guess coronavirus has affected your work plan a little bit this year. Um, so yeah. you mentioned that you were stuck in the house. I guess you're, you're already fairly socially distanced living out there. Um, yeah. How did you come up with something to, to get you out of the house? And, and what was that project? Yep, um, really needed to get outdoors. Um, for my mental well-being, it was really important. And, and this year was always going to be... Um, a year of the wombat, I guess. Um, you know, Yukamara, as I mentioned, been here for 30 years. We've got a very, um, it's, we're in a region which is a stronghold for um, the wombat here. So our wombat species is the southern hairy-nosed wombat. Um, but unfortunately, we just haven't had that opportunity to do targeted surveys. And this was the year to do it. And I was supposed to start it later in the year. But yeah, with, with COVID, um, sort of starting in March, I just said, no, nah, we're doing it now. <laughs> so it was, um, yeah, it, it turned into quite a, I mean, this was the first survey, so it was quite intense. And um, from now on, it will get easier to repeat. Um, so I had some fantastic help from Susie Stockwell, who's a field ecologist with AWC. She was over here doing possum surveys um, at night. And then during the day, she had sort of kicked off the field work for the wombat surveys. And then after she left, um, our land management officer, Spike, he helped me finish it off, um, which was brilliant. So now, for, to... for monitoring something oh. like wombats, so these are big burrowing animals and yeah. they obviously leave their mark in the landscape. I know a lot of farmers don't like them because they, they dig yeah. such extensive warrens and they can damage infrastructure. But that actually yeah. helps you out when you're trying to map out where they are and and how active they are in different parts of the property. Um, so yeah. how did you go about that? Yeah, absolutely. The big warrens absolutely help. So you can actually see them from space. Um, so using satellite imagery, so using Google Earth, um, I was able to, oh, there's a lovely photo. So this is some drone footage of a wombat warren, a very typical wombat warren that we see outside our predator-proof fence. So you can actually see that using Google Earth. And um, so what this survey involved was searching all through the Yukamara property outside the fence. So that's around 3,000 hectares and pretty much mapping anything that could be a warren. So any kind of white patch or um, anything that could be a warren. Um, and then going out and ground truthing that point. So all up, uh, there was 1,169 sites 
that were wombat warrens that were detected through Google Earth. And of those, uh, over 70% were active with war, um, wombats. And a lot of research has been done in the region about wombats, wombat activity, as Joey said, um, because they do make these big warrens, landholders have a love-hate relationship with them at times. Um, so in the region, wombats have been quite uh, an important part of it. So yeah, a lot of great research has been ha happening and um, they've been able to tell how many wombats roughly per active burrow a wombat could occupy. So I use the research that's been done to relate it to what's happening at Yukamara. And based on Helen, the number of active, oh yeah, would, sorry, would you be able to um, just share your screen and show us how you identify them on Google Earth and then um, maybe the results sure. of some of that work? Oh, sure. Okay. All right. Bear with me. Okay. So this is Google Earth. The red outline is Yukamara uh, Sanctuary as the whole property. So that's just over 5,000 hectares. The yellow line is our predator proof area. So all the survey work happened outside of the yellow line. Now, obviously at this kind of resolution, you can't really see too much, but as you zoom in, and everyone gets a little bit motion sick, you can start to see if we go out here, especially. So where I am at the moment is actually an area of the property that's supporting more than half of our wombat population. So you can start to see that there's sort of these white dots and these are all wombat warrens. So if you zoom in a little bit more, whoop. so you can, <laughs> So you can start to see, so this is a wombat warren. All these little white patches are warrens. So it was a matter of going out and, and looking at all of them, working out if they were active or not. And if they were active, how many burrows were active? And this was able to give us um, an estimate on the number of warrens. I'm just gonna show you another screen. of the results. <clears throat> so I guess the, this is, <laughs> this was the end point. So these are all the wombat warrens that were detected through that satellite imagery process. The green ones were active and the white ones were inactive. So of all the wombat warrens that were active, the population estimate, which is conservative because not all wombat warrens can be detected through this method. So there's some warrens, particularly in Mali, which you just can't see, but it's, um, you know, it gives you a very good chunk of what's happening out there. Our population estimate was um, over 2,000 wombats, so 2,100 that we're protecting that's, at Yukmara. Yeah. That's really cool. Um, incredible, yeah. incredible work. And it looks like they're thick on the ground, but of course that's a very big area. Um, yeah, have... look, that's right. When people hear um, 2,000, they think we're, we're walking, and, walking and stumbling over them. You know, there's like a plague out there. But if you actually look at the number of wombats per area that we were working in, it actually equates to um, one wombat per AFL footy ground. So if you can think of an AFL oval with one wombat in the middle of it, that's the sort of densities that we're talking about here at Yukamara. So it's, um, this survey really highlights, I guess, what we thought was happening on the ground. Cause when we do go out spotlighting, when we do surveys out there, we see a lot of them just, you know, sun baking or, or grazing or whatever. Um, so yeah, we know, we knew we were a stronghold for that species, but it's really nice to get that data to back that up. Yeah, and a, another example of how technology changes our survey methods. Helen, we had a couple of questions uh, just during that part about whether the wombats there are mange free, because mange oh. is a big issue with common wombats. Oh, great question. And that is one of the key threats of the southern hairy nosed wombat species as well. So throughout the survey, which, which um, 
spanned over quite um, about three months. We, we saw 83 wombats and not one of them had any physical evidence of mange. We did notice like maybe one or two wombats were probably older individuals, so their fur was a bit scruffy looking compared to the majority. But yeah, really encouraging. There was, there was no physical evidence of mange. Yeah, that's great. Um, and I'll just remind uh, everyone that you can ask questions by using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. We'll get to most of the questions at the end. Um, before that though, I'd like to talk about the education program at Yukamara. Um, this has been running now for, for several years and it's, it's a really important program which exposes school age students to the sorts of work that we do at AWC. And it's really that first step in the pipeline if people are interested in becoming an ecologist. So Helen, do you want to talk about um, some of the school visits and the activities that you do with students out there at UCA? Yeah, so this is a long running, running program. Um, we, we oh, I think over the years, we have had thousands of students, uh, I guess, through the, the feral proof gates. So here you can see um, the hub of the education program is at the education centre. Um, so you can see that here, we've got a beautiful deck out the front where we try to do most of our activities and presentations are done inside and there's um, a great touch table set up for, for kids to really see what, you know, things people find in the bush and, and the Mali and stuff. So it's a really great space to host groups like this. Um, some of the activities we do, it's pretty much centred all on conservation. Um, it's all centred on science. So we've got a number of projects which are science-based projects. And it's a really great way for students to actually go into the field, collect their own data, and then use a bit of maths and get their results and discuss their results in, in the sort of um, the realm of conservation and um, ecology. Most of the students that come out here have never heard of an ecologist or ecology. They'd heard a bit about conservation. So even just to show them this is an option, you know, if you like animals, if you like working outdoors, you don't have to be a zookeeper. There are absolutely more options than that. Um, so I think that's a really important part of the education program is just having those practical examples um, from people that are actually doing the work in the field as well. So yeah, as Zoe said before, we usually get 10 to 12 groups and up to 200 students a year, which range from grade threes all the way up to university students. And uh, we've got an example of some of the university students work on the screen now. Abs budding ecologists, you know. Yep. <laughs> no, this was from our last group. So this was our last group pre-COVID, um, a grade three group uh, from one of the local schools in the Riverland. And particularly with the younger groups, I like them to do little um, art and craft activities, I guess. So this was build a build a build a magnet or build your own postcard. Um, essentially, I like students to be able to take something home. Um, I should also say I live and work here at Yukamara with my husband Tyson who's our sanctuary manager and our seven-year-old. So as a mum I know how much stuff comes home from school and if it's art and crafty stuff it goes on the fridge. So if we can get kids taking home arty crafty stuff from Yukamara and for parents displaying it or caregivers displaying it on their fridge and having that conversation you know, we're not just engaging, um, you know, a bunch of grade threes, we're, we're engaging their parents, siblings, grandparents, any other caregiver. So um, I love doing arty crafty stuff with the younger kids. And I guess with the older kids, um, it's more with, with a previous intern has developed some great stickers and magnets, again, that they can take home maybe have on their folder or fridge and, and hopefully get that conversation going when they leave Yukamara. Yeah, that's, um, it's really important work. And I think, you know, getting this work, these messages out to the younger generation will ensure that there are, you know, future ecologists that will, um, you know, carry on this important work long after we're gone, which is critical. Yeah. Um, 
just thinking of that as a, a kind of pipeline, you know, for, for students, it's really important, but we also have an internship program. So around Australia, we host budding ecologists, uh, usually they're university graduates. We've actually graduated 99 interns since the start of that program. Um, and they're typically three or six month placements. Uh, most of our interns have a bachelor's degree in science and usually with honours. Um, and that is, it really does become a way for us to, uh, you know, pick from the cream of the crop and, and choose um, for our recruitment, some of the best young ecologists in the country. So it's a very competitive program, um, but we're really excited about that and, and graduating our hundredth ecologist probably next year. Um, so it's a, a really good pipeline that we've established uh, in terms of recruiting young ecologists. Helen, at Yukamara, you've also got a special internship, um, which is more focused on science communication. So do you want to just talk about that role? Yeah, this is a great program and it's something that was established six years ago. It's called the Interpretations Internship. So it has a, a little bit of a different focus, I guess, to the conservation and ecology internships um, in that it does focus on science communication and assisting with the education program, as well as the surveys and the science program we have going on. Um, since it's been running, we've had 12 interns, um, which has been awesome. They've all brought such great um, enthusiasm and just a different skill set to the program and fresh eyes and all that sort of stuff. And um, yeah, and they've, they've all gone to do bigger and better things. So some have gone on to do PhDs, some are actually working within AWC. Um, so Susie Stockwell, who I mentioned before, she started her AWC journey as an intern here at Yukamara. And Dr. Karen Young, who's up in the Kimberley, also started um, her journey here. And um, yeah, it's just a really great um, program. It's a really um, sought after program. We'd normally get around 80 applications, which are like high caliber applications. Um, to get a short list is really genuinely difficult because they could all do it. Um, so it's obviously something that's really important to people. I think in this day and age, if, if you're doing science, if you're doing conservation, you're doing all this great data stuff, you need to be able to share it with people. Um, I am a strong believer in that everyone should be able to share with, um, doesn't matter who the person is, just someone on the street. If, if you can engage anyone with what you're doing and why it's important and why you should care about it, I think that's a really important skill to have um, yeah, in this day and age in particular. Mm. Yeah, thanks, Helen. I think that's, um, I think you're right, that uh, nexus between communication and science, you know, being able to translate all of this wonderful work that we're doing into a form that um, can be accessed more widely and is understandable by the general public. It's um, a really important skill. Um, all right, we'll come to questions in a minute. I just want to remind you that if you're inspired by the work that we're doing, you can make a donation at australianwildlife.org. Thank you to all of our existing supporters. We couldn't do this work without you. So that's, that's really important. Um, and if you'd like to read more about the WIRES partnership, which we announced yesterday, there's also a great uh, media release and news story on the website, along with a video that our, our wonderful videographer has put together. Okay, some questions, Helen, and we've got a bunch of wombat questions here. So one is, are there natural predators for something as big as a hairy-nosed wombat? You know, some of their key threats, uh, as I mentioned before, is mange. So many of these populations are very isolated and fragmented. So if you had things like a disease outbreak, it could easily wipe out and locally extinct uh, and, and make that population locally extinct. Um, in terms of predation, I guess one of their biggest predators are humans. Um, there is still a lot of illegal culling that goes on. Um, even though they're not formally listed as endangered or, or rare, they are protected in South Australia under the National Parks and Wildlife Act. Um, but in terms of foxes, cats, dingoes, look, they're not a huge threat to them compared to some of these other threats. So, um, yeah, habitat fragmentation, illegal culling, disease, um, and competition with uh, feral herbivores and stock for um, food are probably the biggest threats. 
Right. Um, okay. Um, we've got a, another question just about the burrows. So if they're digging these extensive burrow systems, is that ever a threat to the fenced area that we've established? How, how's the wombat oh. fence interaction? Great question. So now, no, there are no issues with uh, wombats and the fence. Um, however, we check the fence here at Yukamara three times a week for any kind of issues that might arise, whether it's digging animals or climbing animals or whatever. In the past though, uh, so when the fence was first built in 1990, I have seen field notes from that time that have suggested that wombats were an issue because with something new that might be crossing their path, absolutely, they'll be like, what's going on here? Um, from my understanding, that didn't last for very long. Um, there were a couple of um, hot wires. And again, this is my understanding based on field notes from 30 years ago. So um, my understanding is that they did put up a little bit of hot, some, sorry, hot wires at the base of the fence to try and deter wombats or anything else that might have been going near the fence. Um, and they were decommissioned not long after. So it seems like they did their job. Um, and then not long after that, we didn't, I didn't see any records of, of major issues. But it is definitely something to consider if, if new fences are going up in areas where there's wombats. Um, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, okay, um, another question just about that map that you shared earlier. It seemed like most of the wombats were concentrated in the southern part of the area you surveyed. Was that um, a a real uh, trend or was it just because we didn't survey the northern part of, of the area? Yeah, um, hopefully you can see the map. Okay, so all this area up here was surveyed as well. This is what we call our northern Mallee block. So it's, it's very similar actually to inside the fence. So it's very much dominated by Mallee and also Sugarwood shrubland. And there just weren't as many uh, warrens detected there. So even when we've been walking through that area for like Mallee fowl surveys, for instance, you wouldn't see a lot of wombat warrens. Um, the habitat and the, the geology is quite different out that way. Whereas when you get to these areas out here, um, this is what we call our canopod shrubland habitat. So lots of salt bush and blue bush. The, there's a lot more topsoil, which um, is still overlaid uh, by the calcrete and limestone that's here, which can be very, very thick. So it's just completely different habitat types um, between those two areas. But yeah, that survey was definitely surveyed as well. And just there just weren't as many up there from most likely the habitat type. Yeah, okay. And then a, a couple of questions just about what they eat. Um, are there particular vegetation communities that they prefer? Yes, so most people when they think of wombats, um, most people think they eat grass. When you come out into the semi-arid zone and the Murray Lands region, in particular, you don't see a lot of grass. So the wombat is amazingly adaptable. So what there has been some diet studies done here and in the region in the past. And one of their main food sources is actually a weed called thread iris. Um, they're also known to eat wards weed um, as well as some natives. So they're quite broad with their diet. It's very dependent on rainfall. Um, but thread iris is definitely an important food source for them at the moment. Um, you know, if you go back many, many years, you know, I'm sure there, there would have been a lot more grass around that they would be feeding on, but they've had to adapt like all of us. They're, they're adapting and, you know, they're obviously doing quite well out of the weeds that are out there. Yeah. Okay. Um, and a, a couple of people just interested in how you actually check if a burrow is active. What are the signs you're looking for? Uh, poo. <laughs> A uh, nice, fresh, steamy wombat poo, which is very um, distinct. It's very large. It's usually square shaped, um, but not only that, because that can persist in the landscape for quite a while. So we're also looking for things like um, fresh tracks um, and the active, the active burrows, you know, there's often um, really obvious digging and renovations going on, I guess you could say. And, 
there's no weeds or leaf litter there and there's no cobwebs in the burrow. So it is actually quite easy to tell um, if an entrance is active or inactive. If there's any doubt, because we want to keep our numbers conservative, you know, if there's any doubt, we leave it out. So if you sort of look at it and go, oh, no, nah, just because there'll be another active one just around the corner. So um, yeah. it is quite easy to tell. Yeah. Thanks. Um, we, we quite often get this question coming up, but I think it's, it's always worth asking. If someone was a, a young person interested in becoming an ecologist or in the, the kind of work that we're doing, what would your advice be to them? I love this question. Um, my first piece of advice is to volunteer because it might look like a very um, sexy, interesting job. Um, you might just want to play with bilbies all day. And yes, there is a bit of that, but at the end of the day, uh, we do some pretty hard yards, you know, like spotlighting and freezing temperatures. And it might not just not be for you. So volunteer, find out what you like, what you don't like. What you don't like is just as important as what you do like and what you do love. Um, and particularly volunteer at uni or even now, you know, you can volunteer even when you're at high school. So if there's opportunities in your local area to do that, get out and do it, so important. It also gets your name out there before you're even applying for jobs. So again, you know, I run this um, interpretations internship, so I get to look at the CVs and the applications and whatnot. And if there's someone there that, um, whose name has stood out because they've come on a survey with me before or they've surveyed with a colleague, I'm looking at them straight away because I know they're keen, I know they've um, sought out these opportunities. Also, if you are at university, if anyone's listening, you know, um, just get experience outside of your class work, I guess. So every uni runs field trips and that's great. But what I want to see is people using their initiative and going out and getting more opportunities that someone hasn't told you that you have to do. Um, that really stands out in an application. Um, and for, for younger people, you know, I'm talking like primary kids. I mean, I always had the dream of, of doing this job. I think I would have been maybe 10, eight, nine, I don't know. Um, you know, it was really just figure out what you're passionate about. And, and if you're not sure, just ask questions, you know, work experience, great opportunity to try and figure out what you want to do. Um, but don't be afraid to ask questions with people in the industry. Great advice. Um, and for anyone who is interested in volunteering, we've got a volunteer portal on our website. So if you enter your email there, we'll keep you updated with all of the volunteering opportunities, not just at Yukamara, but around our sanctuaries around Australia. We're just about out of time. Um, so I've got time for maybe one or two more questions. And there's one question here about birds at Yukamara. So you're, you're in the I think it's the Murray Mallee, so it's kind of, you know, that Mallee habitat, and there are some really special birds there. Um, and I just want to share a picture of one of the birds that you've got there, Helen. <laughs> oh, such a great photo. Yeah, so we've got over 120 bird species confirmed at Yukamara. And the really exciting thing is, is that we are still confirming species, you know, today. Um, so even though the property has been here for 30 years and has been protected for 30 years, you know, you just never know what you're going to see. So obviously these one, these are Mallee fowl um, on their beautiful mound, which is located outside of the predator proof fence here at Yukamara. And it, you know, throughout the course of the wombat survey, I found a new Mallee fowl mound and it was active, um, which was really exciting because it has been so dry. We've had three consecutive years of below average rainfall. And now to find this new Mallee Fowl Mound active um, is just awesome. And last year um, on our remote cameras that we use for, for monitoring as part of our land management program here, there was a brush bronze wing. So, you know, these little bird gems just, conti not continually, but they do pop up from time to time. And it just shows how um, 
dynamic these ecosystems are, particularly when things are really dry and things are moving around a bit. Um, but yeah, a number of our species, I, I can't remember off the top of my head, we have quite a high percentage of bird species that are actually um, listed in some way, either rare or endangered. Um, yeah, so it is, it is a great place for birds, yeah. And Helen, if people are interested in visiting, we have open days at Yukamara um, every now and then. How do we find out about those open days? Yes, so the best way is to follow us on our socials, um, as in AWC socials. Um, so normally we do them twice a year, so it coincides with our intern being here. So normally in um, maybe, what is it, normally May and normally September, October. Um, this year, unfortunately, there are no open days scheduled, but um, Mark from 2021 will be up and running, hopefully, as normal. Um, so the best way is, is to follow us on social media and, and there'll be information about it when it comes up. Absolutely. Right, and there's lots of other goodies on our social media channels too, so I do encourage you to follow us on Facebook and Instagram um, if you don't already. Thanks so much for talking to us, Helen. Um, it's been a, a great conversation. Um, and I'm really keen to visit Yukamara. It's one that I haven't been to yet, so um, I'd oh. love to visit. Yes, please do. <laughs> thank you. To everyone who has tuned in, thank you for your support. Remember, this work is not possible without you, and if you'd like to make a donation, you can go to our website, australianwildlife.org. Um, there's a link in the chat which has a, a link to the website there for donating if you're interested. Um, you can read more about all of our work online, on our website, and in Wildlife Matters, our magazine, which comes out twice a year. Next Thursday, I'll be speaking with Viana Leo. Viana runs our project at North Head Sanctuary in Sydney Harbour, so right in, you know, on the doorstep of Australia's largest city. So I hope you'll join me at the same time next week. Thank you very much. <laughs>